السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Dear brothers and sisters, if somebody was to ask the question, what are the ways to preserve Iman from its downfalls and keeping ourselves firm upon the religion of Islam in light of all of the tests around us? The typical answers that we will get to this question will be things like reciting the Qur'an, studying the Book of Allah, having good companionship, visiting the masjid frequently, dua, visiting the graveyards. Every one of these techniques is indispensable. However, there has to be another item added to this list, should this list even come near to completion, and that is visiting the biographies of the righteous ones who came before us. Why is this technique so effective in restoring Iman and keeping it firm? How does it help? Count with me these reasons. Number one, it strengthens a person's inner resolve to proceed as a practicing Muslim just by virtue of reading and understanding these biographies. Look in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala details to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the stories of seven consecutive prophets, one after the other. And then in conclusion, Allah jalla jalaluhu said to him, وَكُلَّنَّ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الرُّسُلِ مَا نُثَبِّتُ بِهِ فؤادك. And each of the stories of the messengers before you, we relate to you so that we may make your heart firm. These stories, they actually give steadfastness to the heart of a believer. And Al-Junaid al-Baghdadi, he would say that Al-Hikayatu, جُنْدٌ مِنْ جُنُودِ اللَّهِ يُقَوِّ بِهَا إِمَانَ الْمُرِيدِينَ Stories are one of the soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which he uses to give strength to the hearts of the believers. So, in essence, coming to grips with the lives of the people who preceded us and how they carried themselves in life allows one to then come to grips with himself and rethink matters in his or her own life. Going through their stories is a soul-reviving experience. So this is number one. Number two, going over their biographies plays a major role in purifying the heart from its many illnesses. Listen to the words of Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, who summed it up so well when he said, رَأَيْتُ الْإِشْتِغَالَ بِالْفِقْهِ وَالسَّمَاعِ الْحَدِيثِ لَا يَكَادُ يَكْفِي فِي صَلَاحِ الْقَلْبِ إِلَّا أَنْ يُمْزَجَ بِالرَّقَائِقِ وَالنَّظَرِ فِي سِيَرِ السَّلَفِ الصَّالِحِينَ He said, I've come to realize that Engrossing yourself in the study of fiqh, the halal and haram, and merely listening to hadith, these on their own, they're barely sufficient to rectify the heart. He said they must be mixed with heart softeners and the study of the lives of those before us. So this is number two. Number three, going over the biographies of those before us is a very effective remedy and a cure to the arrogant sense of self-importance that a lot of people have. Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, he said, وَمَنْ نَظَرَ فِي سِيَرِ السَّلَفِ مِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ الْعَامِلِينَ إِسْتَحْقَرَ نَفْسَهُ فَلَمْ يَتَكَبَّرَ He said, whoever looks into the biographies of the active scholars of the past will automatically belittle himself and he will never feel haughty again. See, the lesser one knows of his predecessors' achievements and their work ethic and how they carried themselves, the greater one will start thinking of himself. Because you've got no frame of reference to compare yourself to. But the opposite is true. And I truly believe that so much of the infighting that is happening today within the da'wah scene amidst the Muslim circles is due to the sheer amount of gaping that people are doing into their own mirror reflections their own achievements, their own followers, their own reach, causing them to grow in their eyes. So they start hating teamwork, they don't like sharing credit, we don't like to acknowledge virtue. And the cure for this is what? To gape into the mirror of the biographies of those before us and then see yourself in that reflection. And what will be the outcome? The outcome will always be a refined and a humble Muslim. So that's number three. Number four, going over the biographies of the righteous ones before us is a very effective technique in nurturing, building love 
for these predecessors. And honestly, honestly speaking, compare how you feel about any one of the greats before you've studied their biographies and then after. How do you feel? It's worlds apart. Now you may say, but why is it important to love them in the first place? In one of the most beautiful ahadith which the Prophet sallallahu narrated to us, he said, Al-mar'u ma'nan ahab. One will be on the day of judgment with those whom he loves. Did you think about the implication of this narration? So, if we are unable to do what they did, at least we can love them. And our hope is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through our love for them, will allow us to stand side by side with them on the day of judgment. And our hope is that He will allow us to enter into the same high grades in Jannah that we hope He will give them. Now we are ready to ask a more specific question. Why have we chosen the lives of the four Imams? Abu Hanifa, and Malik, and Shafi'i, and Ahmad. Why them? The same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed certain events from the past to unfold for the preservation of the Qur'an, like for example what Uthman radiallahu anhu did when he gathered the Muslim ummah upon one recitation of the Qur'an, and the same way that Allah allowed certain events to unfold for the preservation of the sunnah, the prophetic way, by sending people with incredible minds who memorize the chains of transmission and then formulate this amazing science to assess the veracity, the authenticity of each chain of transmission. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that certain events of the past would unfold for the preservation of the study of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, the halal and haram. And one of the most important happenings in our history, which Allah allowed to happen to serve this purpose, was the birth of four individuals who would become the founders of schools of thought that would be adhered to by the overwhelming majority of the Muslim ummah. Who are these men? These exemplary human beings were Imams Abu Hanifa and Malik, Al-Shafi'i and Ahmed. And the earliest of the four, of course, being Imam Abu Hanifa. At this point, I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from allowing this work to stop at mere admiration and mere entertainment and mere storytelling. Doing that would not be a sign of success for me or a success, a sign of success for you. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna bani Israel, lamma halaku qassu. He said that when the children of Israel fell into ruins, when they fell into destruction, what did they do? They, they told stories. Subhanallah. In other words, when they abandoned the doing of good deeds that they were required to do, they turned to easy stuff like storytelling and they relied upon it. We want to take a lesson from the mistakes of those before us. And that's why I have chosen a different model for this series that you are watching. The model of this series is one where the biographies of these remarkable men will be used as a platform to communicate key values relating to worship and pristine manners and high aspirations and vision setting. And this, by the way, will explain the many tangents that you will come across in these videos. The hope is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove me and will remove you and will remove the Muslim ummah from its state of slumber and make this series a means of reformation for myself and for others. So let us begin. Imam Abu Hanifa, his full name is, take note of this, an numan son of Thabit, son of Al-Marzuban. And his nickname is Abu Hanifa. So from the name Al-Marzuban, it becomes clear that Abu Hanifa's origins were Persian. His origins were from Kabul, the capital of modern day Afghanistan. And his grandfather, Al Marzuban, he embraced Islam at the time of Umar ibn al Khattab, before then moving to the city of Kufa in Iraq. Abu Hanifa is the only one of the four Imams who was born during the era of the companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, according to some, Abu Hanifa saw with his own eyes Anas ibn Malik, the companion and servant of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Others have argued that he saw another companion, Abdullah ibn al-Harith, when he was 16 years old during Hajj. And others have argued other things as well. What does that mean? It means that Abu Hanifa is, according to those who assert that he saw some of the companions, he is from the Tabi'een, the second generation Muslims. This makes him the only one of the four Imams who can potentially be considered from the Tabi'een, Allahu Akbar. And therefore, we can say at this point that this is a particular, unique quality for Imam Abu Hanifa from the four Imams and a remarkable privilege as well. And that is because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had praised the first three generations of Islam, did he not? What did he say? He said, He said, the best of all people are my generation. Then those who came after them, after the companions, then those who came after them. Allahu Akbar. What do we know about the birth and the upbringing of Imam Abu Hanifa? Imam al-Dhahabi, he said, وَسِيرَتُهُ تَحْتَمِلْ أَن تُفْرَدَ فِي مُجَلَّدَيْنِ رضي الله عنه ورحمه. He said that the biography of Imam Abu Hanifa can potentially fill two volumes of work. He said, may Allah be pleased with him and have mercy upon him. Subhanallah. Imam Abu Hanifa was born in the city of Kufa in Iraq in the year 80 AH or 699 according to our Gregorian calendar. And he was raised in the midst of a practicing and honorable and a rich Muslim family. It seems that he was the only child as well. His father, Thabit, had a clothes shop in the city of Kufa, which Abu Hanifa would work in after his father passed away. And on this note, I would like to say that this was the way of our predecessors. They refused to be reliant upon anyone for their rizq, for their money, for their daily bread, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're human beings, like everyone else, they need an income. But their freedom to advocate the truth with, with minimal pressure from a financer, that to them was a greater requirement. Prophet Sallallahu said in a remarkable hadith, he said, مَا أَكَلَ أَحَدٌ طَعَامًا قَطُّ خَيْرًا مِنْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ مِنْ عَمَلِ يَدِهِ وَإِنَّ نَبِيَ اللَّهِ دَاوُدْ كَانَ يَأْكُلْ كَانَ يَأْكُلُ مِنْ عَمَلِ يَدِهِ He said, nobody has ever eaten a better meal than the one that he has earned with the working of his own hands. He said, and the Prophet of Allah, David Dawood, he used to eat from the earnings of his manual labor, from the earnings of his own hands. Allahu Akbar. This financial independence is key for the shaykh, for the student of knowledge, for the active Muslim. In fact, Abdul Basit ibn Yusuf al-Gharib, he authored a book where he lists around 400 different professions that belong to no less than 1,500 scholars of Islam. Who said that you have to have no worldly profession to be a scholar of the religion? This is a life lesson, brothers and sisters, this desire to earn independently. We learn this life lesson by just looking at the nicknames of many of the scholars of our religion. What were their nicknames? Look, for example, you have Az-Zajjaj, the glass maker, Al-Qaffal, the locksmith, Al-Najjar, the carpenter, Al-Haddad, the blacksmith, Al-Bazzaz, meaning the draper, Al-Attar, the perfume seller, Al-Qassab, the sugar cane worker, Al-Jassas, the, the plasterer, Al-Khabbaz, the baker. These are nicknames of scholars whom we know and we read about and marvel over their biographies. So this was always the case in our Islamic history, up until maybe quite recently when da'wah and Islamic scholarship became a job title, which one reaps a salary for, like any other job. And in many cases, this would subsequently, this would subsequently be abused by their finances. Who, who would constantly threaten to cut off their wages if they don't comply or, or carve out the fatwa, the Islamic position that suits them. So they are, the shaykh is now speaking on demand and remaining silent on demand. That is not appropriate. The scholars before us therefore sought to have the upper hand and to be financially independent, relying only upon him. Imam Abu Hanifa inherited 200,000 dirhams from his father, a huge fortune, bearing in mind that you could purchase a whole sheep for just three dirhams 
Abu Hanifa inherited 200,000, but he insisted to only keep for himself 4,000. Due to a narration which Ali ibn Abi Talib used to say, which Abu Hanifa cited from him, that 4,000 dirhams is sufficient for a person. And that anything above 4,000 dirhams is considered to be surplus. Abu Hanifa therefore gave himself an allowance of two dirhams a month. That's it. He lived a very minimal life. Although he would wear the finest clothes, this was his trade after all. So he used to spend that extra money on the poor as well as the students of knowledge. In fact, on Abu Yusuf alone, Abu Yusuf, we're going to hear a lot about him, right? a chief judge and one of the main students of Imam Abu Hanifa, he set aside for his student Abu Yusuf a sum of 100 dirhams a month to spend on himself and to spend on his family. That's how the sheikh should be, right? That's how the sheikh should be. Not waiting for his students to spend on him. He should be spending on them, enriching them, empowering them. Wherever possible, of course. Imam Abu Hanifa's beginnings were due to words of encouragement that he had. Simple words of encouragement. Abu Hanifa said, I once passed by a shabi. We know a shabi, right? Scholar of hadith and fiqh, and a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa. A shabi said to me, Ila man Who do you visit? I said, I'm going to the marketplace. He said, no, I don't mean that. I mean, who are the scholars whom you visit? I said, I... I don't visit them much. He said to me, La taghfal. Don't behave thoughtlessly. La taghfal. Wa alayka bin nadari fil haymi wa mujalasati l'ulama fa inni ara fika yaqadha wa haraka. He said, Abu Hanifa, don't behave thoughtlessly, please. And I want you to turn to knowledge and the circles of the scholars because I see in you alertness and I see that you have energy. Allahu Akbar, these words fell heavy on the heart of Abu Hanifa and he left them. Abu Hanifa said, فَوَقَعَ فِي قَلْبِ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ فَتَرَكْتُ الْإِخْتِلَافَ إِلَى السُّوْقِ وَأَخَذْتُ فِي الْعِلْمِ فَنَفَعَنِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْلِهِ He said, the love of what Ash-Shabi said just fell into my heart. So I abandoned the market marketplaces and I turned to knowledge and Allah Almighty benefited me so much by the words of Shabi. See, Brothers and sisters, let's be honest here. Even if we were so young at the time, those moments where we were humiliated or made to feel insignificant in a gathering of some sort, that moment never really leaves us, does it? At the same token, those moments of inspiration and empowerment and those words of encouragement that you had, they also never, they also never leave you. And therefore, during every gathering of yours, whether you're with family around the dinner table, whether you're with friends in a, in a restaurant, uh, whether it's something you spot online, ensure that you identify the talent. And then instantly offer the words of encouragement. And more importantly, direct that skill, that talent that you see in him or her, directed to Allah, directed to the home of the hereafter. Just like a shabi did with Abu Hanifa. In the lives of so many great people before us and in our time and after us, it was just a single statement that they heard and it ended up turning around their lives forever. And I give you just two examples. Look at Imam al-Dhahabi. What started him off? A passing comment within a particular gathering that encouraged him to pursue the path of knowledge. And that was when his Shaykh al-Birzali said to al-Dhahabi, he said, you know your handwriting? It resembles the handwriting of the scholars of hadith. So Al-Dhahabi, he said, الحديث. So from that day onwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the love of hadith within my heart. And then Imam Al-Dhahabi would become Imam Al-Dhahabi and he would excel in many of the Islamic sciences and he would author texts that are just indispensable to our Islamic library today. And we are quoting him time and time again in this lecture series. It started with a statement of encouragement he heard. Similarly, Imam Al-Bukhari, what started him off? It was just a passing comment within a gathering that launched Imam Al-Bukhari into the skies of hadith and fame. And now he has collected for us, as we know, the book that is considered to be the most authentic in existence after the Qur'an, his Sahih, his Al-Jami'ah. 
Al-Bukhari, he said, telling us about where it all started, he said, we were sat in a gathering with our teacher, Ishaq ibn Rahawaya, who said, لَوْ جَمَعْتُمْ كِتَابًا مُخْتَصَرًا لِصَحِيحِ سُنَّةِ النَّبِيِّ He said, why doesn't any one of you think about gathering a summarized book containing all of the authentic narrations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Imam al-Bukhari, he said, فَوَاقَعَ ذَلِكَ فِي قَلْبِي فَأَخَذْتُ فِي جَمْعِ الصَّحِيحِ He said, so instantly the love of doing this fell into my heart and I began to compile the book. Ya Allah. Bearing in mind that Imam al-Bukhari was only 16 years of age when he heard that. And because of that one passing statement, Al-Bukhari decided to dedicate the next 16 years of his life in compilation of this book that every one of us has on his bookshelf or has benefited from or has heard of it. Ya Allah, identify the talents. Look at the words of Badr- Badruddin ibn Jama'a who said, Kunna idha ra'ayna fi sabiyyi nabaha alqayna alayhi shibakana fala yakhruju illa aliman. Whenever we saw a young man who was exhibiting signs of intelligence, we would throw our nets over him. Figuratively speaking, right? We would throw our nets over him. And he would only leave after he had become a scholar. So please don't allow the talents to go to waste. The potential reformers that we are craving for today as Muslims, they exist in huge numbers. They exist today the same way they existed in the past. The only difference is that those before us were blessed with parents, with, 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 with friends, with passers-by who identified those talents in them. They guided those talents. They nurtured them, encouraged them, financed them. And it, it could be just a passing comment of encouragement that you offer someone in a gathering. But to him, those words make him feel or her feel that they were just Given born, they were born on that very day. And it changes the course of their lives and the purpose for which they live for. And then every bit of good that this person does later on in their lives, a copy of it is documented to your scales as well. And after the passage, Allahu Akbar, of 1,300 years, imagine the reward. We hope that Allah has given a shabi because of the path that he set Abu Hanifa upon. We are still benefiting from Abu Hanifa today and most likely till the day of judgment, inshallah. So start with the closest to you, then branch out. Your words of encouragement, they're not going to cost you anything. But to others, it may be an afterlife defining moment. Brothers and sisters, stay with us. We're going to continue in part two, the biography of Imam Abu Hanifa.